the message of Jesus to a world that needs him so much. As we talk about the church and the theme this month is I love the church. We're not talking about our church. We're talking about his church. When we're talking about his church, we're talking about the body of Christ, those that have given their life to Christ. And you look at the impact of our church and our society today with our denominationalism on a decline. You look at different higher denominations, whether they're Methodists or Baptists or Catholics or whatever you look at the denomination. We're not talking about the sign over the door. We're talking about the people within the church, people with a heart and a passion for Jesus. And we're talking about my church. We have to understand this church is Christ's church. As you start thinking about what type of church we should be or what type of church we could be, we have to go back to the early church. And the early church is recorded in Acts chapter 2. Luke uh, wrote the book of Acts. And Luke was communicating to us through the book of Acts about 30 years after the early church began. If you could imagine how the early church started. Jesus started his earthly ministry, and he called these 12 men. And in these 12 men, he saw um, potential. He saw their passion, their willingness to serve. These 12 men followed Jesus for three years. They saw him heal the lame, heal blind eyes, raise Lazarus from death to life. They watched him calm the sea. They watched him pronounced judgment. They saw some great miracles. They heard his teaching. Then one day they were on the way to Jerusalem. Their life, their future was about to change. They went into this upper room and he declared to them this night, I'm going to be betrayed and sent over to deadly men. The disciples at that time, their eyes were open that knew that Jesus wasn't going to be with them for a long time. They were betrayed, and Jesus was arrested. He was put to death. The disciples scattered because of fear. They didn't know what, what was going to take place with them. They saw that their leader, Jesus, was just arrested and beaten and scourged. And now they watch him die on a cross. They watch him come off that cross, and Joseph of Arimathea puts him in his tomb. They saw him dead. They watched him go into the tomb. They knew that this man by the name of Jesus is dead. They went to their upper room crying in fear of what could take place with them. Three days later, they hear about Jesus not, being alive, Jesus not being dead. They go to the tomb and they see that he's arisen. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, that Jesus comes within their midst. And for 40 days, Jesus is talking to them, being seen by hundreds of individuals. The day before the last time they ever see Jesus, He's standing on a mountainside talking to them in Acts chapter 1. And all of a sudden, they see him ascending into heaven. And he said something to them. Before he was ascended, he said, I need you to go to Jerusalem. And I need you to be in the same house. And there will be one greater than I that's going to come to you. Disciples were a little weird, freaking out. They didn't know what was going on. So they stayed in the upper room for 10 days until the day of Pentecost had fully come. The day of Pentecost means 50. 50 days from the Passover is the day of Pentecost. It was a feast. And the day of Pentecost, everybody would be coming to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. And that day, the day of Pentecost is the day that God sent to us, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, once it resided upon the disciples, it was the day the church began. It was the day power began. Jesus told his disciples, do not go 
anywhere. Do not do anything until I send to you the Holy Spirit. And once they received the Holy Spirit, once God gave to them the power of the Holy Spirit, everything changed. The one day they were afraid of their life. One day they were cowering in a room. The next day they stood up and Peter proclaimed and 3,000 people gave their life to Christ. What's the change? The same individuals, the same personality, the same education. What changed? How did the early church start in fear, in chaos, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, with the spiritual leaders putting Jesus to death, afraid of their life? But now, the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit came upon them with boldness. They stood up and they proclaimed the message that Jesus is the only way to get from your sins to heaven. When you look at the early church, the passion, the vision, the direction that they have, there has to be something that we can take. We look at our church and we look at churches in the United States in the Western civilization, we look at that and we see there's no power. We do believe that the body of Christ is growing. The believers in Jesus are growing. But the church, there has to be a wake-up call. There has to be something that's real within our church, within our life. If not, the body of Christ will grow. But the entity called the local church must go back to the root cause, the, the ideals that it was established with. See, when, when the early church was started, they didn't know they were going to be the early church. They didn't understand what was taking place. They didn't have any idea that Luke was going to write 30 years in the future, talk about them. They just started doing. They just started talking. They just started preaching. They just started sharing. When they got up and talked, they began the church. It was natural. It was just something that they did. They formed a group of people that had a passion for Christ, that they had one common goal in mind, and that was they received Jesus. They had Jesus in their core, and when they received Jesus, they received the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I believe in our culture today, we believe in, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. I believe that he died on the cross and he shed his blood for my sins. I even believe that he died and he was buried and he rose again and he believed he conquered death, hell, and the grave. I believe it. And at that point, we have our faith in Christ, we have our fire insurance secured, and we're going to heaven because if we believe in Jesus, we're saved. But I believe what Jesus truly desires, like the early church, is not believing in Jesus alone, but following Jesus. Be passionate followers of Jesus. I believe the church can wake up from its slumber when we not only have faith in Christ, we want to be led by Christ. We want to have a passion for Christ. We want to see people with a life. We want to see people redeemed. We want to see people's lives transformed. We want to see people alive and well because of Christ. When we have that, we can look at what Jesus was telling Peter. And he said this, and thou art Peter, and upon the rock I will build my church. And guess what can't happen? When Jesus builds his church, you know, let's say it together, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. If we allow Christ to build his church, that's your life. We are the church. We're the body of Christ. If we allow Christ to build us up, if we allow Christ to allow us to be passionate followers of Christ and obedient to his, he will build the church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against your life. When we follow after Christ, we are the church. We're the body of Christ. We should stand up. We should proclaim it. We should be excited about what God could do. When they were together in the upper room, the Bible says they were together and they were in all one accord and they had awe and fear of God. When was the last time we came to the house of God and we had the awe of God? 
Sometimes we have the, oh, oh, going back to church. But the passionate love and excitement that I get to experience something today that I don't get every day, I get to experience the passion, the vision, the indwelling, the fullness of God. There should be an awe and excitement every day of our life when we get to experience what God wants for our life. But the church sometimes gets humdrum. We go to church because it's Sunday. We go to church because that's what we're supposed to do. If we ever got to the point that we had an awe of God, when we remember where Christ has taken us, when we remember our failures and our sins, we remember that I was destitute and I was going to hell until Jesus came into my life. Then we'll have an excitement. Then we'll remember where we came from. Then we will share Christ. But I believe there's so many things that we need to remember. And I want to just list a few things that I believe that we, we should take and look at the distinctives of the early church what they did, and we should do these. And if we do these things, we can have the power and the ability to fulfill even what Jesus did in the early church. At the very first day, the very first day of the church, Jesus did something miraculous. And here's the first one. The brand of the church, without even knowing what the brand is, the brand was Jesus. The name of the door, this is Jesus Church. This is all about Jesus. When they communicated, they communicated what Jesus had done, the miracles that he performed, the power that he was given. They proclaimed that Jesus died on the cross. You crucified him. And because of his crucifixion, we have the power to proclaim the truth. Peter's sermon started about verse 14, but I want to go down to about verse 32 in Acts chapter 2. It says this, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. All these people were witnesses of what Jesus just did. I mean, this was, this was within the last two months of everything that was taking place. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. God raised him up gave to him the authority, conquered death, hell, and the grave, standing at God's side, giving to us the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything they did, everything they saw, was the witness that Jesus was their head. He was the king. He was the one and only head of the church. The Bible even says that Jesus is the head of the church and we are his body. We are his workmanship. Everything that we have is because of him. Everything that we do should be because of him. Everything that we sing should be about him. Everything that we communicate should be for him. He is the brand. When somebody comes to church or any church, they ought to hear about Jesus. They ought to hear about the transforming power that Jesus gave within their life how we have prayed and how he has conquered. When we were hurting, he stood up. When we communicate the brand that Jesus is my Savior, it gives us power and it gives us something to hold on to. Because when they say, what's your church all about? It should be easy for us to say, our church is all about Jesus. It all boils down. It all boils down whether we are a Jesus church or we a me church. Is it all about the members of the church or is it about the head of the church? And if we all ad identify with the head of the church, which is Jesus, we should all say, what does Jesus want? What, do I, what can I do to honor him? Because once we understand the, the brand of the church is Jesus, the currency of the church has to be the word of God. It has to be the word of God. And I like what, the, what, what does the Bible say? I like when somebody texts me and says, hey, hey, I'm thinking about this. What does the Bible say about such and such a matter? Because I, they could ask me, Bruce, what do you think? But you know what? When they're having troubles in their life, when they're struggling, what Bruce has to say about anything is not going to help them. It's not going to transform their life. 
It's not going to give them a solid rock of foundation in the midst of a storm. But when they say, what does the Bible say? Well, I could give them some scripture and I can tell them what the Bible says about their issue. They can hold on to that. Because we know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We understand that he wants to help us. And the solid rock of the word of God can help us. It has to be the currency. It has to be what we spend. It has to be our life. We have to understand that Jesus is our brand, but the word of God is what we peddle. We do not peddle opinions. We do not talk about what we used to do, what our denomination thinks, or what, we, what the church would like. What we have to understand is that the Word of God is the only foundation in which we could take a stand for our future. And when we understand that, we understand that's exactly what we have in verse 36. Therefore, let, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, we have to get the picture. The day of Pentecost and Thousands of people were coming to the feast. Peter was just indwelt by the power of the Holy Spirit. These unbelievers were out there. And Jesus sent the Holy Spirit of God. Peter's never experienced this. He said, I've stood up. And I proclaimed a message to these people that some persecuted Jesus. Some mocked him. Some laughed at him. Some may have even been healed by him or fed by him, but didn't have faith in him. And Peter stood up and he said, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the words of God. And you, some of you, some of you even crucified him. The power that this humble man had to proclaim that he stood up in the face of adversity and he said, and some of you put him to death. The ability to communicate the truth of the word of God, even in the midst of adversity, has to be able to give us the power in order to say and tell the truth. And number three is the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection. We would think that Jesus he died on the cross, and he was buried, and he rose again. The power of death, the power that Jesus proclaimed, that Jesus is not dead. Because if Jesus was dead, if Jesus died, if Jesus died on the cross for our sins, if we put all of our sins on Jesus' back, and Jesus died and shed his blood and was buried, but he did not raise from the dead, we would still be in our sins. Because the death, the burial, and the resurrection of life gave us power over our sin. We have the ability to live where Christ wants us to live in our nature of Christ because Jesus died and rose again. It gives us that power. It's that Easter Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning should be an Easter Sunday morning because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that I can confess my sins. I know that he is going to forgive my sins and he has the power to get rid of my sins because of the resurrection, because he has conquered death, sin, and the grave. It gives us that power and it gives us that ability. What, what I think is really neat is how do we see the resurrection power now. We understand that Jesus died on the cross and we understand he was buried and he rose again, but what does that do for me right now? Well, how many of us have failed? How many of us feel like a failure? How many of us have broken God's commandment? You know, I can put both hands, both feet in the air. I mean, every day I'm a sinning individual but I love God. You are a sinner, and you love God. But let me tell you what God does for you. He loves you. And because he loves you, and because we accept that he has the power to forgive us, we humbly go before him, and we admit our sin. We say, I need your help. Jesus loves us to the point that he forgives us. Our salvation 
is our belief in Christ. But after our salvation, once we believe in him, then we are radically changed. The Holy Spirit comes within our life. We confess our sins. We turn away. We turn 180 degrees away from our sin. It puts a smile on God's face because our passion for him, our love for him, is that we want to please him. Please Jesus. Take the word of God. Understand the power of God is to change. When we admit, I can't do this alone. When we admit, I am a failure. And we admit that Jesus loves us so much that he doesn't want us to think that. He doesn't want us to live in that. He wants us to radically take us and deliver us. So when we see who we are, we see Christ. We see the word of God. We see the power that Jesus had over death. That is how Christ wants us to see the church. Us, you, me, the body of Christ. Not a name over the church, but the people within the doors. But if we do not see Christ as real within our lives, we think that we have to come to church to experience God, we have put the Holy Spirit, we put God's power, we put our salvation within these doors? How small is that? How small is God? But we are the body of Christ. The Bible says, let me read this to you, this is awesome. In Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all loneliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called with hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. What does that mean? That means the Holy Spirit lives within the heart of the church. You. The church, if it is only assembled on Sunday morning within these four walls, and that's the only time that the Holy Spirit will ever do his work, we serve a very small God. But you know what? My God is the creator of this world. My God has given to me hope, peace, and the ability to conquer death, hell, and the grave. My God, my Savior, has said, I have given to you a a passion within your soul, the charisma to stand up and proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. We are not dead in our sins. We are not dead to our past. We can use our past to catapult us into the future. But where does all this go? I think it goes to the fourth point is our leading is from the Holy Spirit. Our leading is from the Holy Spirit. Well, it it gets very unique here. In Acts chapter 1, it tells us when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord, in one place, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven and the rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house and they were setting. And there appeared to them as divine tongues as fire and one set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, we are supposed to be a a Baptist church. And the Baptists, we don't talk about tongues. Now, if we put a dove on our sign, we could talk about tongues. But let me be real with you. I believe we have failed the power of God when we do not understand the purpose that God had in store for Acts chapter 2. The Acts chapter 2 church, the power of the Holy Spirit, what gave them the ability to communicate the truth. Tongues was to communicate so they can talk about the power and the forgiveness and the love of Jesus to a Gentile world that did not know Christ. So when the, when the believers in Christ were filled with the Holy Spirit and they could speak, those that heard spoke and heard from their, from their own language that they were born in. When they spoke, they spoke. And the miracle of the tongues where people heard 
in their own language. And they believed that Jesus was the Lord because the Holy Spirit of God did the work. In the church house, what we need to do is we need to communicate the truth, communicate the honesty of the very word of God. And I love that. This is kind of weird, but I love this. They're sitting in the office, and people come in and talk, and, they, and I'm preaching on something way over here on left field. And they say, Bruce, listen, dude. When you were preaching Sunday, did my wife call you? Because everything that you said, we talked about the week before, and you hit the nail on the head. What is it? That's the Holy Spirit taking the very words that is communicated, applying it to your heart, convict where you are, and the Holy Spirit of God does the work. When we allow God to speak through us and for us with the power and the passion that God has in for us, the Holy Spirit then does his job. The leading of the Spirit. Now, there's a story found in Acts chapter 3 about a beggar. A beggar at the gate. The disciples walked up to him and they were asking, he was asking for money and the beggar uh, did this every day for his entire life, probably about 40 years old. He didn't walk. He had no money. And the disciples walked up to him and they saw him sitting at the temple. And the disciples said, guys, sorry, silver and gold we don't have. But that which I do have, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm sure the beggars, <laughs> dude, I just need some money. They touched him. They healed him. And what they gave to him was more important than any financial resource that they could ever have. He got up. He went to the temple. He was telling people, praising God, what God had done. His disciples looked at him, and they said, go tell. Go tell everybody what Jesus had done. The Sanhedrin, they got chapped because this guy was proclaiming the message that a guy by the name of Jesus was healed, and Jesus was dead. The Sanhedrin said, that didn't happen. Peter, James, and John stood in front of the Sanhedrin. And they said, listen, dudes, Jesus is dead. Stop it. I don't want you to say his name again. I want him out of here. Never say his name again, or what happened to him is going to happen to you. Boldness stood up. Listen to what happens. I love this verse. In Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for good deeds done to a harmless man, by what means he has made him well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Sometimes the power of the Holy Spirit in the midst of adversity, fear, pain, and sometimes even embarrassment, we have to get on our face before God and say, Lord, I need you. I need you now. Because I know in the next few minutes, or I know in the next day, I'm going to have people against me, and I need your power. I need your ability. And he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit in front of people that could have put him to death. And he said, I'm going to tell you the truth. Your God is dead. My God, Jesus, raised him, healed him. And it was some of you that put him to death, and you're scared of what Jesus is doing after his resurrection. And I liked what they said in Acts chapter 4, verse 31. They stood before the Sanhedrin and they were scared. They came back to the upper room, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were all assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. With boldness. How'd they get it? They were afraid. And in their fear, whatever you have to deal with, 
within their fear, they got together with fear, with respect, with awe, and they said, Lord, I need you. I need you now. I'm dealing with something that's over my head. I need you now. And when we pray, and we ask God to work within our hearts and our lives, and we are the family of God, the children of God, God does great and mighty things with us. And with boldness, with boldness, they can do exactly what God wants them to do. And you can too. The body of Christ is you. When I say I love my church, I love my Lord. I love the church. I love you as individuals. I love to see what God is going to do. I'm excited about next Sunday, giving the state of the church address, talking about where we've been in the past and what we're going to do in the future. I'm, I'm excited about the, the opportunities that we have set in, for, in front of us, and I love that part of the church. But what I'm really excited about, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Am I only going to allow God to work on Sunday morning during a 15-minute invitation when the elders are down here, when the pastor's down here during a song of invitation? Is that the only time God works? If that's the only time God works, we're wasting his time. My God, so much bigger. Because he loves you. He's empowered you. He has gifted you. He is leading you. He has given to you a salvation by the name of Jesus. He's given to you the very word of God. He's given to you the power through the resurrection. And he is leading you every day with the power and the leading of of the speck of God, the Holy Spirit, that is greater than Jesus in your heart to give you power, vision, direction, and love. Let us allow him to lead us. You know, there's a little saying here that there's a TV show, a movie, We Are Marshall. You remember that show? We Are Marshall. The coach gets up and there was a plane crash, and most of the football players were dead. And um, This coach started a football team from scratch, and he had to motivate this football team. The coaches didn't want to coach, and some of the players didn't want to play that did live. They felt bad, and so he started this team from scratch. And the big vote, the big motivator within their life is he would say, we are, and they would say, Marshall. We are Marshall. And I believe there has to be a motivation within our church when we say who we are, we're not Glenville. Who we are, we represent one name. And that name is bigger and higher than any other name. And that name is the name of Jesus. So when somebody would say, tell me about your church, I pray. I pray that we can say this. You know what? I don't really know what denomination we are. I really don't know all the doctrines of the church. There's one thing I do know. We love Jesus. One thing I know, that I was a sinner, and now I'm saved. There's one thing I know. When we sing, we sing about Jesus. One thing I know, when the Bible's open, we preach about Jesus. Because there's only one thing that I know, is I can't live my life without Jesus. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we love you. I pray that you'll give us the passion that we need to have, and the charisma that we need to have to stand up and draw people to you, the ability to sing our songs and to proclaim our message and to give our testimony, to open up the word of God through prayer, to allow us to teach and read, to allow us to saturate our life, allow us to be the church that has a passion and a love to proclaim your name above everything else, even in the midst of adversity. In fear, let us proclaim that Jesus, Jesus, Jesus changed my life. And I am part of his church because he loved me. And he gave to me heaven, forgiveness, salvation, and the spirit of God. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.